we are looking at five assurances we have in Jesus. And so we've looked at already the assurance of forgiveness and what a wonderful, like phenomenal thing it is to have our forgiveness assured. And then uh, not, only to, not only to know that in some sort of uh, intellectual or academic sense, but then to live in light of that assurance. Uh, the assurance of freedom, uh, freedom from a sin, from the penalty of sin, uh, is really has been amazing to look at that as well. Today we're going to be looking at the assurance of, well, let me, let me first say, uh, <clears throat> in the coming weeks, we're going to be looking at the assurance of answered prayer. And that might be, out, out of all these assurances, the one that you go, oh, wait a second, because I've prayed for things and those things haven't happened as I, as I asked. And so I think that's going to be a really good one. Also today, it might also be one of those ones where you say, man, this is an assurance. It's the assurance of victory we're looking at today. Uh, in particular, we're going to be looking at victory over temptation or victory in temptation and victory in trial or suffering. As so again, you might think to yourself, oh, this is, you say victory, assurance of victory? How can that possibly be? Because I'm still getting tempted <clears throat> or I'm still struggling or life is not how I would want it to be. Or coupled with uh, looking at next week, you know, assurance of answer to prayer. You might say, man, I've asked God to take me out of this suffering or to help me with this temptation. And here I am still in the middle of suffering. Or God didn't take me out of that suffering. That suffering or trial uh, came to its kind of natural conclusion. And, and here I am and still alive and may have even grown through that. But where was God? And so we're going to be looking at what does it mean? to have assurance of victory in those two areas, victory in trials and victory in temptation. And if you're not, in particular for you, if you're not feeling particularly victorious right now, <clears throat> or even if you are feeling very victorious, but your feeling of victory rests in your circumstances and not in what we're going to look at today, uh, I, I want to say, maybe at both ends of that spectrum, they are, that's a shaky ground to tread on. Whereas, I want to show you from Scripture, we actually have the assurance of victory that we can confidently walk in today, in our trials and in temptation. So let's pray, and then we'll get stuck in Scripture. <clears throat> so Father, wanna, I want to thank you firstly for your love and attention on us. Not attention as a displeased father, but as a, as a loving father. Not as a distant creator, but as an imminent father. Thank you that when you saved us, you haven't just wiped the slate clean. You haven't just set us back you know, under our own strength to try to reach up to you again, but that you've done everything necessary for us to walk in victory. And so today as we look at this, Father, help us to, to, to know these truths, to believe them, to live in them, to confidently, boldly speak and live and act in light of what we know to be true, this victory we have in our trials and the victory we have in temptation. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. So let's start with temptation. Victory in temptation. A key verse for this is 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Uh, and this is what it says. It says, No temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity, common to everybody. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation, he'll also provide the way out so that you will be able to bear it. So if we look at the first part here, we see again, like we've seen over the last couple of weeks, what, how can we have assurance? Because the assurance of these things is based, is grounded and founded in God's faithfulness. This is where we started. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to humanity. God is faithful. 
This is where he starts the thought. So as we're thinking about how do we walk in victory, even in the midst of temptation, we've got to, we've got to remind ourselves as always, every promise is based, founded, grounded, anchored in God's faithfulness. Not in my ability, not in my ability to ha- even hang on to him, but his faithfulness to hang on to me and hang on to you. His faithfulness to do what he says he's going to do. So again, like we've seen the last couple of weeks, it's, it's the same foundation. We can talk about like a situational victory. We can say, yeah, we have, I had victory in this situation, but I didn't really have victory in that situation. Or I overcame this temptation, but I succumbed to this temptation based on my strength, based on my faithfulness. When we're talking about the assurance of victory, we're talking about the assurance of victory anchored in God's own faithfulness. Oh, lost my notes. Secondly, we see the limitation of temptation. So God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. So God in his wisdom and in his sovereignty allows us to go through temptations. If you're reading through uh, the Bible in a year with us, um, last week you would have read the temptation of Christ in the desert after 40 days and Jesus himself is tempted. Temptation, you got to... You, one of the things that is so important to understand when it comes to temptation is that temptation isn't itself sinful. Jesus was tempted, Scripture tells us, yet was without sin. What happens is the deceiver will come in and say, well, you are being tempted, therefore you're a sinner. If you were really transformed, you wouldn't be tempted. And if you're feeling this way, please remember Jesus, the perfect Holy One of Heaven was tempted, but he was without sin. It says here, God will not uh, give us or allow us to be tempted beyond our ability. He knows our strengths. He knows our weaknesses. He promises that he won't allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear. So we are assured on the basis of his faithfulness that when we're tempted... It won't be beyond what we're able to bear. So in your experience, you might think, oh, but wait a second, I I have been tempted to the degree that I felt compelled to do this. I couldn't not do that thing. We'll we'll have a look at that in a minute. Thirdly, he provides a way of escape. He goes on, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you will be able to endure it. So Paul's writing to the Corinthian church, reminding them, man, our assurance is based on the faithfulness of God that every temptation in his sovereignty, him being God over all things, allows us to go through. He won't allow us to bear temptation greater than our ability to endure. And he will always provide us a way out. He'll always provide us a way to escape. May come in various forms through prayer or scripture, support of the family of Christ here at church or, or elsewhere, the enduring presence of the Holy Spirit. Again, us, us reminding ourselves through scripture of the person and work of Christ, what he's done for us, how he lived, even how he was tempted and yet was without sin. And whatever form it takes, God's provision ensures we have everything we need to stand. And this is where the verse we read before kind of, comes into full colour, that 1 John 5, 4. Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith, our trust in Jesus, our allegiance to Jesus, our trust in his faithfulness to us so that when we do get tempted, when we are subject to temptation, to sin, to abandon him, to turn from him, very small or very large, it's in our faith, our trust in him and his faithfulness to us. That is our victory over the world. These two things are, are really 
inextricably intertwined. God's faithfulness to us and then our faith, our trust, our allegiance to him. We say, no, my, because of what he's done, because of the spirit in me, I am able to escape because the beauty and the supremacy, the wonder and the holiness of Jesus rules and reigns so supremely in my life that my faith in him, my trust in him, my allegiance to him is the thing that provides my escape. For everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So it's not based on my strength. It's not based on my abilities. It's not based on my willpower. It's not based on even like all of the wise scaffolding and accountability I could put in my life. And I, I highly recommend all of those things. I recommend exercising and growing in your willpower. I recommend you know, scaffolding your life with uh, great relationships and accountability and, and friendships and brothers and sisters who will speak into your life as you speak into theirs. But that is not the thing that assures us of overcoming temptation or victory in temptation, but rather God's faithfulness to us and our faith in him. What about our victory in our trial? So victory in temptation, we'll, come, we'll look back there again. What about our victory in trial? I love this passage in Romans 8, one of the most famous passages, maybe in all of Scripture, which helps us, to, helps us to understand how we walk in victory. This is what he, this is what he writes to the church in Rome. He says, who can, be, who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Again, he draws our attention first to God's faithfulness to us. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He's also at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or anguish, meaning distress, or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. We are more than victorious or more than conquerors, your version might say. Or the newer translation says we are overwhelmingly victorious. So we haven't just won, as in like we, we have done the like minimum viable product or minimum uh, activity necessary to overcome. Like if you're thinking in a, in, a, in a war or battle situation, you can be victorious by attaining your objective, whatever that is. But Paul's writing says, no, we are overwhelmingly victorious. Like vi- the, the line for victory was so far back there, we're so far beyond Victory, we are overwhelmingly victorious through him who loved us. And he goes on, for I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will have the power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So right back at the start, he says, who could bring an accusation? Remember when the deceiver comes? When the accuser comes? And he says, oh, you're being tempted. Therefore... How can you say you belong to Jesus if you're being tempted? And Paul says, no, no, who who can bring an accusation? There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The only condemnation we have left is when we believe lies about who we are and about what God's done. When we lose sight of God's faithfulness to us, that's when we can start to believe the accuser We don't claim our righteousness anymore, our own righteousness. I'm not standing on my own actions, my own strength, my own willpower, my own goodness. We don't, again, we've seen this every week, we don't need to create a facade of doing well so that other people would think well of us. That's not where our strength comes from. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. What it means is the the trials that you're going through now are not evidence of Jesus abandoning you. The trials that you're going through, the suffering that you have, the the workplace relationship breakdown, uh, the family relationship breakdown, the physical health breakdown, uh, the financial breakdown, whatever it is that you're going through right now, 
all of those struggles, that they are not evidence of God's lack of love for you. They're not evidence of his wavering or do I like you, do I not like you? Oh, when was the last time you read your Bible? Oh, I'm going to withhold from you. When was the last time you prayed, I'm going to withhold from you? <laughs> he says, nothing separates us from love of God. Nothing. There is no, there is no more condemnation. Just who can accuse you? There's nothing left to accuse because we don't stand on our own righteousness anymore. We're overwhelmingly victorious. Not just conquerors, but more than that. Your version might say more than conquerors. So conqueror here, more than conqueror there. Victorious here, overwhelmingly victorious there. Not, on the, not just on the winning side, but, but we ourselves are the victors walking in victory. I see some faces going, but wait a second. I'm still in the trial. How can I be walking in victory if I'm in the trial? I'm glad you asked, because we actually skipped a bit of scripture, which we're going to go back to now. <clears throat> back to verse 35. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or anguish or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Here's a bit we missed. As it is written, because of you, we're being put to death all day long. We're counted as sheep to be slaughtered. Verse 37, no, in all these things, we are overwhelmingly victorious through Christ who loves us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, angels, rulers, things present, things to come, powers, height, depth, any other created thing has the power to separate us from the love of Christ, our love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So the, the key to walking in the assurance of victory is again, first, its base is founded on God's faithfulness to us. And secondly, our victory is not denoted by our circumstance. Paul doesn't say, after all these things, we walk victorious. After nakedness, after the sword, after persecution, after danger, after affliction. Once all those things are done, then we walk in victory. However, I put it to you in 2024, in the church in the West, that's how we speak. When we're going through trials, because we've believed the accuser, we think, oh, God loves me less. I can't share this with other people because they'll think God has abandoned me. And I can't face that reality. Well, it's not a reality. And so they say, so I'm, not, I'm gonna withdraw from community when I'm struggling. And then when I've overcome my struggle, when I overcome my trial, then I'll come back and say, I am now walking in victory. That's not what the Bible says. It's not how it works. Paul writes, it's in these things. We are overwhelmingly victorious. Not just surviving, not just you keep, keep going and you'll get there. Muster up all the willpower you can and, and you might make the finish line, we hope. Just pray real hard. No, it says in those things, in your trial, you are overwhelmingly victorious. We're already walking in victory. Again, it's a whole mindset shift. That my goal is not that God would so order my circumstances to make my life pleasant and sweet, comfortable and lazy. <clears throat> but so many of our prayers are oriented around smoothing the road ahead of us. Get me out of this trial. Have you, have you read through the New Testament, read through the book of Acts or through Paul's letters and hear when he, when he writes to the churches and he says, here's how you can pray for me. He'll, he'll say, he'll just finish boasting and things like, I was shipwrecked a couple times and I was beaten a couple times and they threw rocks at me until they thought I was dead and dragged me out of the city thinking I was dead and uh, there were times where they rioted against me and I've been in jail a bunch of times and they, they left me for dead, etc., etc." And he says, and this is how you can pray for me, that I have a greater opportunity for the gospel, that I proclaim his goodness boldly. Oh, man. What he doesn't say is, uh, I'm, sick of, I'm sick of the trials. Pray that God would give me smooth sailing. 
I'm not aware of any, any of those prayers requested in the New Testament. <clears throat> now, I'm not saying don't ask God to help you in your circumstances. Absolutely, 100%. What I'm trying to say is we need to reorient our understanding of our trials. Our trials are not evidence of God's lack of love for you. They're not evidence of God's lack of ability to take you out of those if he wanted to. Those trials are not evidence that you are not victorious. <clears throat> like James says, Jesus' brother, says those trials are actually doing a work in us. They're doing something in us. And he, he, he has this chain, this progression that leads to perfection. And so we're here in the middle of trials going, God, get me out of the trials. And God is saying, that trial is so you become perfect. Our goal is to be like Jesus. And God allows or even sends trials so that we would be perfect. And Paul writes later in this um, book and he says, they are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory. And we say, get us out. Because we lose perspective of God's faithfulness and what he's accomplishing in us through the trials. You are already more than victorious, even in your trials. Our trials reveal to us our inherent weakness. Our trials, I mean, they kill pride, our trials. Especially when we, especially when we, li like when we bring our trials into community and don't run away from community because because it's attacking our pride that we're, that we're suffering. We can't do this in our own strength. Or that we think that we're, we're a lesser than Christian because if we were a better Christian, we'd have the faith to overcome this trial. Even though we're already victorious in the trial, we misunderstand and so we withdraw from community where God has gifted us community so that we might kill our pride through our suffering. <clears throat> Humbles us over and over, leads us back to God, reveals to us the uselessness of human effort apart from God. Teaches us to rely on Jesus. Causes us to love Jesus all the more and to run from sin. Causes us to see his faithfulness over and over and over and over again. Not faithfulness that we measure by the comfort of our circumstances. Leads us to a life of continual repentance. Makes us more watchful for the encroachment of sin, more discerning of the, the voice of the accuser to us that we can reject. Encouraging, uh, encourages us to develop habits of holiness. It necessitates us bearing one another's burdens when we go through trials in community together. And it leads us to go to God daily instead of seeking out like easy, microwavable, instant results. I was praying for someone during the week. Uh, Beck and I were at a church planning conference. Uh, we're like, we're the old guys at the conference. And so, um, you know, lots of praying for and speaking with people who are, you know, fairly new in their church planning journey. And uh, I remember praying for one person who has had a, just a, a significantly difficult time in their health in the last 18 months or so. <clears throat> and immediately after I prayed, I actually felt this conviction from the Holy Spirit uh, that I had prayed for this person's circumstances to ease before I asked that God would have his way in that like refining, perfecting process that I know this person actually has found so helpful for her faith. Here's what Paul says in Romans 8. <clears throat> it's not that the weak you get, the spirit makes up for your lack and brings you up to the level of like success or strength or overcoming or whatever, but that the fleshly strength you're striving so hard to live in and overcome and hide in the weakness and projecting the strength and those kind of things, that fleshly strength is your greatest weakness. I'm not saying don't put in human effort, absolutely, effort, definitely, but it's not your effort that's gonna get you there. Hear me, hear Paul. Our trust in our strength is our greatest weakness. It 
in these things, we're overwhelmingly victorious. Not after them, not as we rise above them, not as we try to pretend that they don't exist uh, or deny them, not as we hide from them, but in them. Because when we are weak, then we are strong. In our trials, God is accomplishing something in us. We are already, already overwhelmingly victorious. And so when we, when we try to be strong and hide our weakness, that actually robs us, again, of our greatest strength, which is the faithfulness of God and our trust and faith in him. This is what Matthew Henry writes about this. <clears throat> he says, Though the infirmities of Christians are great and many, so that they would be overpowered if left to themselves, yet the Holy Spirit supports us. The Spirit, as an enlightening Spirit, teaches us what to pray for. As a sanctifying Spirit works and stirs up praying graces. As a comforting Spirit silences our fears and helps us over all discouragements. The Holy Spirit is the spring of all desires towards God, which are, more often, which are often more than words can utter. The Spirit who searches the hearts can perceive the mind and the will of the Spirit, the renewed mind, and advocates His cause. The Spirit makes intercession to God and the enemy prevails not. So again, he's saying, don't try to waste your suffering by only trying to escape it. What is God doing in you even now, in your suffering? Peter writes similarly, 1 Peter 6, in this you greatly rejoice. This is what you rejoice in greatly. Though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. So again, even Peter writes, we rejoice greatly even when we're going through trials. Again, it's a reorienting of our perspective of what victory is, what trials are and what the faithfulness of God looks like in our lives. We rejoice greatly that our faith is being refined through suffering grief of all kinds of trials. And Peter suffered trials. Paul suffered trials. All of the apostles who were writing these things to us, they're not writing from some like uh, mansion on the coast where they have servants feeding them grapes and fanning them with you know, palm fronds saying, oh, you plebs should suffer well while we're over here doing amazingly. Uh, Peter, he was crucified upside down. The Apostle Andrew crucified as well on an X-shaped cross. Matthew was impaled on the ground and they're beheaded. These guys knew they knew suffering. Bartholomew was flayed to death. That's disgusting, torn to shreds by a whip. Philip was impaled by iron hooks on his ankles, hung upside down till he died. James was beheaded, like the one who says, consider a pure joy, my friends, when he faced trials of many kinds. Matthias, he replaced Judas, stoned then beheaded. John was boiled alive, didn't die, so they chucked him out on a rock somewhere. The other James, thrown from the top of a temple and then beaten to death. Paul was beaten and stoned and shipwrecked. Jowled, left, left for dead. And most likely, from church history, uh, we know that he was most likely beheaded at the end. These are the guys writing, God is faithful. These are the guys writing, you are already overwhelmingly victorious. Overwhelmingly victorious in your trials. Overwhelmingly victorious in your temptation because of the faithfulness of Jesus and our exercised faith and trust in Him. We have assurance of victory. Again, it doesn't, it might not sound like victory from a worldly perspective, but we don't have a worldly perspective. Let's pray together. Father God, I want to thank you for the victory we have in Jesus. You are so good to us. And so help us in our minds to gain the mind of Christ, to think about things as they really are, to anchor our hope 
in your faithfulness. And then, Father, to walk in the victory of our faith and trust in him. For everyone who's struggling through trials or temptation or both right now, Lord, please help us to see the way of escape that you have given us. To not try to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps or kind of muster our own will or strength, but to work, to really operate in the strength of your Holy Spirit, to remember the example and the work and the finished work of Jesus and live as those who are overwhelmingly victorious. In Jesus' name, amen.